so the paper I'm presenting on today is entitled uh, Identifying Disgruntled Employee Systems Fraud Risk Through Text Mining, A Simple Solution for a Multi-Billion Dollar Problem. A Simple Solution, a Complicated Title. Um, and so basically, the idea here focuses around this problem of employee fraud. So they come up with a bunch of statistics in the beginning of the paper, uh, which I've included here. So around the time of the study, which was, I think, early 2000s, check, uh, oh yeah, 2008, 75% uh, of companies had experienced some type of fraud. Uh, so one, uh, one in three companies didn't, but every other company did. And based on uh, the estimates that they quoted in the paper, this totals to $652 billion or about 5% of corporate revenues on average per company. Uh, I think the amount per company was like 8.2 million. So uh, three quarters of companies lose about 8.2 million a year to fraud. Um, this is a little deceptive because this is fraud in general and the paper focuses on employee fraud, uh, but nonetheless, it's still a big, big number. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, um, in forensic accounting, there's this idea called the fraud triangle. And it focuses on three separate areas that basically can cause employees or other people to commit fraud. And the three areas are opportunity, incentive, and rationalization, right? So if you have uh, an opportunity, or if an employee has some sort of incentive to commit fraud, for example, maybe they uh, bought a house that they can't really afford, they need the money. Um, and then rationalization refers to the idea that uh, some, somewhere along the line, the employee or person committing the fraud has to conform the idea of fraud, which we all know to be wrong, to their moral and ethical standards. So that's the idea of rationalization. And the paper talks about the fact that a majority of software that's out there um, and papers that are published primarily focus on opportunity and not the other two areas of the fraud triangle. Um, uh, from my own experience, when you take fraud uh, accounting classes, um, most of what the auditors are looking for is opportunity. Um, there's an element of looking for incentive uh, because the idea is that um, this is for internal auditors or people on the floor working within the company to determine if their coworkers have all of a sudden developed some sort of incentive um, to commit fraud. And rationalization is one of the least focused on. Uh, within the scope of auditing, the only area that really focuses on rationalization is this idea of tone at the top. And the idea here is that if you have a strong corporate leadership, and they define a corporate code of ethics very clearly to all their employees, there's a less likelihood that employees will be able to rationalize the idea of fraud with their own moral code. Um, but there's not a lot of emphasis put on these two areas. So the paper kind of focuses on these, and that's the idea behind what they're trying to do here. They're trying to come up with a system that can detect uh, disgruntled employees through emails that may be likely to commit fraud. And the idea here is that if a, an employee is disgruntled, they're not happy with the company. And they're more likely to be able to rationalize committing fraud against the company, um, or they may also have a greater incentive to commit fraud because they feel that the company isn't doing them justice. Uh, maybe they're being underpaid. Uh, maybe they have some sort of problem with the boss. Maybe they weren't given a promotion that they felt that they deserved. Um, so these kind of all lend towards rationalization and incentive and not so much opportunity. Um, but what I found personally interesting was the title of the paper leads you to believe that it's a system for detecting fraud and it's not. It's a system for detecting disgruntled employees or not even really disgruntled employees, just disgruntled employee communications. Uh, so you could have an employee that's not actually disgruntled that just has a bad day their email may get flagged, um, and the paper doesn't really give any kind of uh, consideration to that kind of effect, except for a brief note at the end when they talk about how this plays into the detection of fraud. Um, but, yeah. So, is it just a 
side discussion, the profile, do they say opportunity sensitive rationalization is a key component? Yeah. And when you look at the AICP guideline, they, they use pressure as a most component, and opportunity and rationalization as a profile. So the conclusion is if someone is under pressure to commit a fraud, the point is that it's management. They have to, you know, the incentive is to give it to their performance, they're more likely to overstate their ratings. So there are slight differences when they talk about what the AICPA consider is a key component of profile. So it's an incentive, they call it a pressure. I heard it both ways, uh, but my forensic teacher told me that he prefers incentive as well because uh, pressure wouldn't, for example, if you had a situation where an employee sees a very easy fraud opportunity um, and they don't think they're gonna get away with it, that might provide incentive, but then there's no pressure element there. But I see it, it's more or less, it's very similar, and I see it both ways. Uh, so the contribution of this paper, oh yeah, Andrea. Did they, I don't remember this mentioned in the paper, but did they say how much of the fraud is related to unhappy employees? Because they talk about measuring rationalization, but measuring rash management rationalization is very difficult because management can be deceptive. So what they talk on, they do talk, they don't, they don't quote any direct numbers. They just say that it's been published and it's in the literature that disgruntled employees are more likely to commit fraud than other types of employees when you're looking at fraud, uh, employee fraud. That's uh, really all they talk about. Um, that's in their section 1.2, the case for incorporating disgruntled employee fraud risk indicators. So they, they briefly do, but I also don't think that the link is like, I, I, I personally think there were a lot of problems with this case. Um, so anyway, the author designs a system basically for identifying disgruntled employee emails and she argues that employees that are most likely to commit fraud are ones that are disgruntled because it's easier for them to rationalize um, and they may have more of an incentive uh, to commit fraud. Uh, while her system isn't actually extended to examining messages that indicate fraud, for example if there's wording within an email that may indicate that the employee is actually planning a fraud or committing fraud. Um, she mentions that it would be a logical extension of the uh, what she calls artifact that she creates to to do what she does, classifying disgruntled employees. Um, and then the other thing here was she didn't actually she wasn't able to get emails from a company, so she tests it on a small population of online message board posts. Um, that she collects. Uh, we'll go over that in a little bit. Uh, so basically the sample was 80. She later adds 10 more at the very end for classification. Um, I wasn't really clear on why she did this. Um, but basically she took them from online discussion boards um, and she said that when she was drawing the sample, half of them were drawn to be non-disgruntled employee posts, and half of them were designed to be disgruntled employee posts. And she had a second coder review the data, and um, they assigned them identically. So it was a 50-50 split, and there was a unanimous agreement as to which were disgruntled and which weren't. Um, this is an overview of the, the methodology that she used, and then at the bottom, you see kind of what she did for the clustering. So basically the idea was to obtain the sample and do some minimum preparations. Uh, then what she did was she did a preliminary assessment of the predicted power of the model, um, and that was to kind of come up with uh, what kind of parameters she wanted to use for the later stage of um, using it for a prediction. Then she used uh, a subsample to train the algorithms to predict whether it was from a disgruntled employee or not. And then, then there was the prediction and then the assessment of the results. So in terms of the clustering, basically uh, what she did was she split the, set the sentences, labeled each word based on its part of speech, uh, removed stop words, um, stemmed the words, converted the term list to a table, 
which she could then apply TF-IDF weighting to. Um, she did a few other things at this stage, cleaning out words that were, um, if a word, for example, was only present in one document, then it was removed from the list, or if a word was present in a majority of documents, she removed it, but she didn't actually report what that threshold was. Um, and then at the end, once it was weighted, she would cluster the documents and then use this later for the prediction, um, prediction algorithm. So basically for the text preparation, uh, first what she did was once she pulled it off of the message boards, she had to embed it into this uh, email mailbox file format. Um, I wasn't totally clear on why she did this other than to say that this is how she wanted to apply it, so she wanted to show that this was how it was done. And then the fact that uh, when it was converted to this format, it was in like one continuous document, correct? So other than that, I wasn't really too sure what the advantage was. She kind of talked about it a little bit. Um, there was something she mentioned about the file uh, size of it. Like she mentioned that it is much more better for larger appropriations. They would have much more larger So I guess mostly it was just to prove that it could be used in like a larger corporate email setting. Yeah, she kind of, I just talk about this. Later in the document, she says that uh, we need to care about the size of the documents. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This was why she used the clustering method. That she yeah. Um, so basically, she tested two different part of speech taggers. Uh, this one, Brill, and the other one, Bait. And basically, uh, there were some differences in how they worked, uh, but the gate one was what she used because it performed better, and the reason why was it was uh, trained based on Wall Street Journal articles. The other one used some sort of like uh, probabilistic method or something, um, but it was almost indistinguishable which one worked better. Um, so there were 48 different parts of speech that um, were available to be tagged. Um, so then this was the idea of what she removed, uh, ones in almost every document or those in only one document. And then as I mentioned before, basically she does a TF-IDF weight to determine uh, which, which uh, documents in the, which words in the document vector were more important than other words. Right? Um, so once this was converted into a vector, it was used for clustering. So she kind of did two stages of clustering. So the first stage was this, um, agglomerative hierarchical clustering, which looks like this, right? And basically what happens is in this, this is what went, you can, this is called a dendogram. This is one way to visualize it. The other way is uh, with like overlapping circles and things like that on a plane, the points. Um, so basically what you're doing here is you're picking the two closest points and then you're clustering that as one cluster. Then you're looking for the next two closest points and you're clustering that as another cluster. And you keep doing that until every point is clustered. If the two, if one of the two closest points that you find um, is part of a cluster, then you, you cluster it into a super cluster. Like, for example, right here, these two are already clustered. So later on, um, when you're looking to cluster again, when you want to cluster this point right here, um, it just gets lumped in with this earlier cluster. And then you build this hierarchical structure. Um, and basically what you see um, is the final two groups that get clustered is the disgruntled and the non-disgruntled. And you keep doing this clustering method until every point is clustered in a supercluster, right? So that's how this works. Um, so she says that she doesn't want to do this for all of the documents because it could take too long. Uh, so she does it for a sample of the documents. I had a little bit of a problem with this for two reasons. First of all, I don't think her sample is that big. There's only 80 documents. Second of all, even if that's true, she doesn't report what size of sample she used to create this dead right, at all. So you really don't have any kind of clue, and you take her for her word that it was enough to create this. Once she created this uh, idea where you get the features for the two main clusters, um, she used k-means methods for clustering. And the way that works, is each new point is classified based on which cluster it's closest to. So she tried a few different distance measures, uh, Euclidean distance and um, cosine similarity, and she ended up using cosine similarity just because that was um, 
the measure that seemed to cluster the best. Yeah? So I kind of get the point of saying like you can use that to start if you're dealing with actually a large amount of documents. But I think my biggest concern overall in this paper was the fact that a lot of things she mentioned should we go, this might be useful if we had a lot more documents. And she but it didn't really work. So we'll we'll try something else. And I was like, well, if you're actually talking about a process that we built for large amounts of information and, and you're writing things off because you don't have enough information to use it, are you really testing those technologies correctly? Yeah, so uh, at the very end of the slideshow, I have a list of complaints about this paper. That's <laughs> <laughs> on there. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I see the value of the paper. I think it's a really cool thing that she did, but I don't agree with most of it. And everything that could potentially pose a problem seems to be magically unreported. Like for example, this idea where she split the sample into two different cluster methods, and she doesn't actually tell you how she did it. Like she doesn't report a lot of the different values. Um, she mentions in a minute what I'm going to show you is she mentions that when she does different uh, training sample versus test sample sizes, there are some versions where there was no error. But for some reason, she chose not to report that. She chose to report the 80-20 split where there was error. Uh, so there's a lot of questionable decisions that go into this and its applicability, but I'll get to that towards the end. Um, but basically, this is how she did the cluster. Um, so this was the dendrogram that I went over. So this was the methodology behind uh, assigning the, the, the documents to different clusters once she had trained the algorithm. So it's the same thing, basically. She converted uh, the mailbox to a mining standard format, which you have to do if you're operating on a mail platform. Split the sentences, label the parts of speech, remove stop words, stem terms, um, convert term list to table, and weight them. And then, um, this I didn't really understand. She split it again, and then used it as a prediction. But I guess what she was doing here was re referencing the fact that she was repeating the last step and doing it like full, like tenfold time kind of situation where you split randomly into training and test and then you run the test again and again and again to determine an overall accuracy um, and basically predict a sample classification. So she used a naive Bayes prediction model um, and that was used to predict the class, which is kind of probabilistic. And what she did uh, mention was that if you use logarithmic smoothing, um, the results got a little bit better. I kind of, again, had a little bit of problem with this because there was a couple other instances where she said that there were minor improvements in results. Um, and she kind of just, uh, when she mentioned that, she kind of just dismissed it. All these improvements she kept dismissing. But I wonder that if you were using a bigger sample, and trying to classify larger data if those differences would actually be much larger. Um, and the idea behind this logarithmic smoothing is because you're using probabilistic um, weighting on where it gets classified, uh, there are some times where you get like very small amounts and it becomes almost like a minute difference. Um, but when you use the logarithmic smoothing, that works out a lot better. So basically she mentions that she tried different training sets and pulled out sample sizes and it varied from a 50-50 split to a 90-10 split. She did everything in between. She said 80-20 was what she reported. She doesn't say why she chose that one, even though she does report that some of these combinations that she tested had zero error, which to me would indicate that it was a better model. So why would change it? Um, so basically these were her results from the 80-20 split. Um, it was an 89% um, success rate, which, I mean, doesn't say much when you're only like predicting 18. Um, basically, there were two incorrect predictions and they happened to both fall into the best type of like category for her paper, basically. She got to show what it was like for a type one and a type two error, okay? So, um, she basically said, that the biggest problem that you could have would be the idea of if you predict a non-disgruntled employee and you actually have a disgruntled employee, right? Um, it's not as bad if you predict a disgruntled employee and they're not disgruntled because there's no harm, no foul. If you look into them and you find out that it's actually not the case, 
no big deal. It's a much bigger problem if you misclassify them as being safe and they could actually commit fraud. Um, so that's basically what you're getting from this results table, the discussion about that. Um, maybe that's why she chose this one to report. Um, so this is my list of complaints and limitations. So basically, uh, she says the methodology can be extended to a whole bunch of different areas of fraud detection and employee emails. Um, she comes up with this idea of, which I thought was kind of cool, she relates it to marketing, um, a basket of goods type approach. So the idea here, is uh, when you look at your sales within a store like Walmart, um, they found, for example, that uh, people that go to buy diapers may often buy like beer if they're male because they want to get drunk, they're dealing with a baby or something, I don't know. The idea is you bundle those goods together and sell them as one and you can generate higher sales. So her, her twist on this is you gotta find different types of indicators within the emails that when bundled together are sold as like a fraud person, right? So maybe they have words that they use that indicate that they're unhappy with the employer and that there's relaxed internal controls and maybe they'll commit this type of fraud um, versus other keyword indicators may indicate that they're committing a different type of fraud. Um, so that was kind of a novel concept, um, but again, it's not really tested because she doesn't really look at keywords or anything like that. It's just a classification type of methodology she uses here. Um, the other thing, okay, so, so now we're getting to the problem. So first of all, I think it's kind of oversold. It doesn't really tell you about fraud. I'm also a little shaky on the relationship between disgruntled employee and fraud. I'm sure there is a relationship there, but there's no numbers to support that or studies to support that anywhere in her paper, um, which to me indicates that that's more of a problem. I mean, it's well and good for you to find a whole bunch of disgruntled employees in your company, but if you can't even prove that they're likely to commit fraud, what is the point of doing that? Um, she even notes in her paper um, at the end when she discusses how to use the results that just detecting a disgruntled employee does not indicate that they are committing fraud, just that they may commit fraud. So she highlights the importance of not confronting the employee until you dig a little deeper and find evidence of fraud, all right? Um, because the issue here is uh, you may actually cause the employee to become more disgruntled if they are already a little unhappy with your company and they find out that you're accusing them of a crime that they're not committing, they're gonna be even less happy about it. Um, so there was that issue. The other issue that, that she discussed was the idea that if the employees find out you're monitoring their emails, then maybe they won't be happy about that. Um, but I think that's stupid because everyone's told all the time that your company has full rights to your email. Everyone, everyone I know that works in the professional world already knows it, right? Um, I also think that that's a limitation that she doesn't discuss here. She doesn't apply it to employee emails. She applies it to external message boards. And people know that they're not gonna be discovered on the external message boards by their boss. Um, she does acknowledge that in a lot of times people were able to figure out the identities of other people posting on these message boards, but in my opinion, uh, nobody's gonna send incriminating emails on their company email account. Or they're much less likely to do so than they are to publish in some sort of obscure online forum where they could do it anonymously, and even if they don't, the likelihood of their boss going out of their way to find this is much lower than in an employee email situation. Uh, so in my, in my own opinion, she says that it's difficult for her to get this data from a company, and that may be true, but you're not proving that your system works for employee emails. The success rate may be much lower for actual emails than message board posts because they're not as clearly distinguished as with uh, disgruntled versus non-disgruntled message board posts. Um, I also don't think this was a large enough sample. Um, I mean, she had the technology to do it. I mean, she could have just pulled off more, more uh, data from online source. 80 is not a big sample. She adds 10 more at the end, but even still, it's less than 100. She even mentions that she had to do different uh, versions of the clustering because she wasn't getting clearly defined clusters sometimes 
and that's a huge problem, and that can easily be overcome by getting a much larger sample. Um, she even comes up with a clustering method that can handle a large volume of a sample, and she doesn't use a large volume sample. Um, so I really didn't like that aspect of it. Um, she also, in my opinion, took a lot of liberties to kind of improve the results. She, she did a lot of like, manip I don't want to really say manipulated, but it seemed like she just kept testing things and testing things and testing things until something seemed to work and said that's the best approach, right? So I kind of had an issue with that. But then again, I understand because your, your first approach may not always be the best approach. Um, and then the last one here, which I mentioned, is I don't really know that this will work on corporate emails instead of message board posts because, I mean, come on, like, if you're, com like, the idea is to find fraud, right? If you're committing a fraud, like, you're going to talk about that on your company email? I don't know. All right, I'm skeptical. But anyway, it was a cool idea. It was a novel idea. It can definitely be extended. Um, you could fix, if you want to publish it, you could could fix the problems that I found. I'm sure you get it published. Um, and you could definitely extend it to, to focus on the keywords more and discover more about if you get actually a sample of emails from an employee that was known to have committed fraud, maybe you can actually come up with a list of keywords that you can look for in emails that may indicate that the employee is actually committing fraud instead of just an unhappy employee. Questions? Yeah. Uh, I know you do that. Why this in the context of fraud, student and this spectrum of the student employees? Yeah. And you do have this problem. But I do see the failure of this paper when we apply it beyond, uh, I mean, outside the company, for example, the customer, uh, disadvantaged customers. And that are failure. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That would uh, definitely be good. If you go to Amazon and then there's a product review in Amazon, right? And that are failure. Like, it's for sure more than. More than thousand review. Like even if you did it where you like weren't even looking, you just took disgruntled ones and you clustered them and found out why they were disgruntled. Mm -hmm. That would also be another application. So yeah, the methodology is cool. The combination of clustering and all that, I thought that was good, but uh, the application <coughs> was lacking. Any other questions? of the posts right. and so she basically wasn't sure what topics would be clustered into what category and what they're showing here is like if you're discussing promotions that kind of a post would be clustered into the non-disgruntled pile instead of the disgruntled pile. That's one of that's one of the most things that probably is like Yeah yeah I mean I agree and there were definitely things in here that seemed um, a little Questionable. She even mentioned it in the paper that was surprising. Like, for example, transfer advice. Right? Why would you be asking for transfer advice if you weren't unhappy with where you were in the first place? Um, and that, that's a good question. But she said that uh, based on, like, you also have to base it on the fact of like all the words being used, the tone of the document that comes up with the vector score at the end. And while it may not be easily explained to us, it is what it is. I mean. Know what else to I mean, they use to kind of bring the methodology to say just so you can use that as a diagnostic tool for your company so you know what kind of topics the employees are most disgruntled about, then you know that is a strength of strategy for your company to focus on those areas. I think that's more important for a company to understand the motivation of the employees. So that would be a great use for the company, but um, within the scope of the paper, she wants to automate the process of doing this because she even notes that um, employees may be, like, whether, even if they found out about this system of like detecting disgruntled employees, um, they'd be more comfortable with the idea of knowing that a machine was doing it automatically than a person reviewing it. Um, and in that case, it's, it's a little more difficult to kind of 
find this information out. Um, but it, again, that would more call into question the idea of how did they, when they were classifying, because originally they were the ones classifying the documents as disgruntled versus non-disgruntled. So maybe they weren't doing a good job of that. I would think maybe that's not the case though because two of them coded it and they got the same results. Um, but it could very well be the case that um, that the word promotions may come up a lot, or the word transfer advice may come up a lot, but then there's words preceding or following that that indicate within the document as a whole that it's not really like, stop worrying about promotions. All right, promotions is gonna come out then, but like, they're saying stop worrying about it. Yeah? I'd love to see an extension of something like this in terms of email communications to like messenger services used to companies. Everywhere I've worked has used Slack or some other system like all of those systems where people, people don't really realize it yet, or starting to realize it, but they're searchable by the people who run the company. And so it's all private messages, it's all rapid, it's much more similar to communication types that we use on a much more casual basis. Um, so, and you can make groups and all those things, so there's consequently a lot, much more casual and sometimes indicating conversations. Yes. So using a tool like this for something like that, first of all, I think the data is a lot more, a lot, more, very accessible. And also looking at how those kinds of communications go down are much more relevant to a present day situation. Yeah. So that was a good point. She mentioned in the paper that you could extend it to chat services. Um, I didn't really think much about it, but now that you mention it, I do think that would be a better application. Everyone, know, okay, everyone knows their emails get searched. Everyone knows that if you have a company phone, they own all the data on that phone and all these kinds of things. But in my opinion, if you really have a problem, like email is a fairly formal version of communication nowadays. Um, if you're willing to complain to your coworkers about a boss or something, you're not gonna send them an email about it. You're gonna send them a text or you're gonna send them a chat message or something that's much less formal and they may not think through it as much as they do when they're writing an email. Okay. Understanding of how it works is basically um, it plots it on uh, on the so you have the clusters on a vector space and what it does is it determines the probability that that point belongs to each of the neighboring clusters and then based on uh, the probability score it assigns it to a cluster. Is that correct? Does he use the clusters in the model or is that like two separate exercises? What do you mean? I mean, I know she creates this dendrogram, right? And she does uh, cosine similarity. But the, the cluster size. properties that aren't the determined. Is that part of the Nagy Bayes model? Huh? Is that part of the Nagy Bayes model, the, the clusters? Yeah, yeah, because, okay, so what happens is first she creates the broader clusters. Then she assigns the remaining documents to uh, each of the two clusters. Then she comes up with a list of cluster characteristics. And then based on those cluster characteristics, when a new document enters the area, 
the Bayes model determines based on its characteristics versus the overall characteristics of these two, which one it would be more likely to belong to, and assigns it to one of those groups. Okay, I just don't see why she does that because she already has labeled data, right? She went out and found the disgruntled comments and the non-disgruntled comments. So that's all you need beforehand to run a database classification model. So I don't know why she has the clustering. I think that her idea was that maybe there are factors that she's not really consciously thinking about um, that are determining whether it's disgruntled versus non-disgruntled. But I also agree because she's preconditioning the data in the first place when she first picks them out as being one or the other. I, I mean, she's okay. She's either preconditioning the data to do clustering, or she's coming up with with the clusters on her own and not, and then doing this for pretty much no reason. We're going to have a class where we talk about a base classification, but that will be there. You, you're teaching that work, right? Yeah. You're going to teach base, yeah. right? Nice. So we'll go into that in more detail there. I guess how it works. It's very easy to do. Also, I wanted to point out that this is a 2009 article. So earlier this year, Google released its API for identifying toxic comments or trolls based on their comments. And maybe that could be applicable to something like this. I mean, if she were to do this again, maybe she could use this Google API. It's called Google Perspective. And it might make a good idea for one of you to, I, I don't know where you find toxic comments in the data we look at so far, but it would be interesting to add Google's technology or Facebook's technology, they're really the two leaders in the natural language processing, I think. And you find something that they're doing to apply to our data sets. I don't think we see a lot of that in the Cambridge. Uh, that's all I have. Anyone else? Okay, thanks. Wait, hold on. I just want to brag that I'm not the last author. <laughs> I'm the fifth author. Right. 
with some strategic uh, uh, characteristic in their talk, in their speaking. So, such as maybe uh, they want to use more specific, uh, more specific uh, things, such as uh, the time, the number, the location. I don't know to make them themselves more convincing. But maybe there is another. I, I mean, you can also think differently. Maybe they are telling a lie, so they are not familiar with the uh, specific things, so so that they might be more ambiguous than the truth teller. So you can always think two ways. So that's why it's interesting to see the results. And hypothesis A is that the linguistic components of prepared spoken utterances differ from those unprepared utterances. I think this is a little bit uh, straightforward, and I think it easy, can be easily understood because I think there will be differences between prepared and unprepared spoken language. And the hypothesis 1b is that the, uh, uh, okay, so hypothesis 1a is about the linguistic characteristics, and hypothesis 1b is about the vocalic uh, characteristics. So linguistic characteristics are uh, includes length, level of detail, complexity, hygiene, and uncertainty language, or something like that. And the linguistic characteristics focus more on the voice. I mean, the characteristic in the voice, such as the pitch, the voice quality, and the tempo, the loudness, something like that. And the main uh, we are most interested about the vocalics during the broad related utterances because we want to know how to detect how to detect voice from the, the way the, uh, the speakers talk. And there are a lot of research, researches on the vocalics, um, on the vocalics and the design, I mean, um, how to detect fraud from vocalic characteristics. And uh, there are some evidence that high pitch, fast tempo, and loudness are indicators of arousal and negative effect. Um, so maybe uh, we can run a test on the, uh, on the sample that we will talk about later to see if there is some uh, support, supporting evidence for those previous research. Relative to non fraudulent utterances, fraud related utterances are higher pitched, lower in voice quality, louder, and with longer response latencies. And an upward pitch slow and differential tempo, especially during unprepared remarks, um, which is suggested by the previous research. Can you tell me? You said red. Yeah, well. <laughs> hey, I have a question. Are, these, uh, are these strategic or not strategic, or is there any sort of? I mean, you mentioned in the beginning, yeah. they're strategic and non strategic, yeah. deceptive behaviors, right? Yeah. So, I mean, do these hypotheses kind of fall into those different categories? Or, uh, or are they all jumbled together? Are these strategic or not strategic? I'm just. I can't tell from uh, Yeah. I guess it's different um, and difficult to tell whether it's different. Or prepare the box okay. more related to the. Um, I'm preparing it more related to the strategy, and prepared is more related to strategic. Go 
go, go to hypothesis one. Okay, so these are prepared, spoken utterances. So these are all uh, supposedly strategic, right? Because they've had time to do it. Prepare. It's carefully choreographed.
they might use more answers and words in their language. In their language. So, um, and they do not want to have any commitments on their uh, what this what they talk about. So, um, hypothesis two B is two D is that relative to non fraudulent utterances, fraudulent utterances includes more hygiene and answers language so that they can reduce their risk of having a why, why does it keep saying uh, especially during unprepared remarks? Sorry? It says especially during unprepared remarks in the hypothesis. Mm -hmm. um, actually
during unprepared remarks to um, the speakers try to hide something so difficult to understand the language. And there is also immediacy and personality. Um, the previous research shows that when person tells tell the whole story, they try not to use the words such as me, myself, I, because they want to keep a longer distance between the whole story and themselves, so that they, that might reduce their risk. So the hypothesis to have is that um, fraudulent utterances include fewer self referring pronouns, pronouns such as I, me, something like that, and more pronouns referring others, so that maybe they can attribute the false story to us, I don't know. And more passive voice and more future tense, especially during unprepared remarks. Do you understand what passive voice is? Uh, yeah, passive voice is um, uh, for example, the financial statement is prepared by someone else. Is that a passive voice? Uh, yeah. Okay. You could say someone prepared the financial statements. Okay. That's active voice. Okay. You could say it was prepared by someone. Yeah. That's And effects. Separate the earnings conference calls into utterances. 
utterance means uh, sentence or partially sentence or question. Oh, yeah. 
significant. Uh, so there are obviously differences between
just say that for the unscripted portion, there was no difference between fraud statements and other statements, but it was lower on average than the prepared one. But you said there was a difference between. Was that difference significant between the fraud and other in the prepared remarks? Or you said it was almost significant? We don't care about this book. This is a book out of Well, we care. I was just joking. We can move on. Let's go to the next chart. Okay. The next picture. The next chart is the complexity. So what's the complexity? Can someone pull that up? You have that right there, right? So all spelled words, three syllables or longer, uh, singular mass nouns, plural nouns, ordinary conjunctions, commas, and average sentences on the same address. So a lot of the same things we have in readability, right? But then also commas, number of nouns, plural nouns, and mass nouns. Mass nouns. I don't remember Who remembers what mass nouns? I'm sure it's a little different. I wrote code to get it. Uh, uh, nouns know is something that cannot be counted. Or a noun to know is in the normal that cannot be counted, but that may be countable when it refers to different units or things. Such as? Their example here is like, um, drinks and coffee versus order two coffees. Drinks? Uh, like drinks and coffee or two oh. coffees. I can't really count how many that first one was. Drinks are probably. Yeah. How I know that. So go ahead. So this one says there's no difference between the fraud and non fraud for the prepared remarks, right? Oh, uh, yeah. For in, in terms of complexity, which makes a lot of sense, right? Because uh, it's prepared. It's prepared, like you said, by a committee. By someone else, maybe. Yeah. Um, but. the hypothesis was not supported. They expected the opposite, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the hypothesis that, that if the person tied lies, they might, they cannot simultaneously tell in a false story, false story and... And now I have to see if... Uh, hold on a second. I really like this result, that complexity result. I really like it. Because I feel like if you're trying to, I mean, it just shows how persuasive the liar is trying to be by maintaining the complex sentence. In my opinion, this could be one explanation. They're trying to drown the truth with so many words. Um, the light hierarchy 
sales less immediate data breaches and they use more non immediate I mean they try to uh, maximize their distance between the thing that they talk about and themselves. And the results show that um, the fraud related risk statements has higher non immediate language in prepare section. Uh, which is a little bit uh, counterintuitive because we, uh, we think that for the prepared ones, they should be, you know, um, and for the unprepared ones, it's a little bit strange that uh, the fraud related risk statement has lower than immediate languages. But actually, with with that, they have higher. Right. Um, now you may see if I'm not right. Instead, fraud has less non immediacy answer.
Within the HTML tags, I removing some table contents and other the font or style or name tags because there are some companies using the tags uh, font or style tag in the middle of the item name. So they say, let's for example, I IT and open the the font font tag and or the style tag. So it's difficult to find exactly find out the item, the specific word. So I'm removing those, the, some kind of huddle text, text. And after that, I convert the plain text. And by using, based on those plain text, I look, i looking for the location like item 6 or item 7 or item 7a like the professor did last time for the XBRL tag. So finding out those locations and then cut those between two locations for indicating the MDNA section. So, oh yeah. The whole filing is divided by the document tag for large lump sum. So I divided by the document tags and one containing the 10K using those the type 10K tags. So I specific focus on those 10K parts. Or some companies use HTML, but still now some companies just using the text for their 10K. So if there is no HTML 10K to find out another text, text for the 10k parts and for the later parts uh, later purpose I I save the only 10k part as a HTML tags for later purposes and after that I looking for some tables because in the MDNA section they are also containing the tables for explaining their financial statement but we are only we usually mainly on the texture content. So at first step, I remove the tables, but not all tables have, the, uh, some of the tables have their texture content inside of the tables. So you mean the MDNA text is all inside of the table? No, no, oh. not. Oh, but you're saying there's some text in the table that you might want to look at? Yes, yeah, right. Including the table of contents and those things are uh, using pressed by the table text. So I counted some of the numbers and this is just my criteria. So if the number number of the numbers is a little bit more than just whole portion of the content, removing those text tables because it more relating or containing the number of financial information or things like that rather than just text information. So I made up this six, number six is by trial and error things. So Yeah, 10 characters. Because some... You're looking in the table? Yeah, I, I found the whole table and... And the number count times 6? Yeah. So, the, in, within the table, there are some numbers. There are some characters and numbers. So, if I, I increasing those numbers to find out which is the containing many numbers or which is just plain text tables. So there's more numbers than, so uh, than so uh, whatever the number times six. This is the whole character of the inside of the table and this is only for the number of numbers. The plain text is all letters? In within the tables. In the table? Yes. And number count is just number of whole numbers. So if there are some some limit of numbers, I uh, deleted. Uh, 
so yeah, remove tables. And as I mentioned before, the item is divided by some strange tags in the middle of item the world. So sorry, you go back to where you're removing things from the table. So you're removing the tables if they have numbers. Finding out the table text which contain the tables. context it looks maybe there is some tables for mentioning or explaining some numbers and uh, labels so I removing those kind of things which contain large numbers in the table. Well you keeping the text that's your preference. Uh, Keep the text from the table. No, I remove whole tables if it is more relating to the number of financial yeah. information. Okay, in that case, just remove the whole table. And the criteria is just by my experience. I increased those one by one. <laughs> and yeah, some of the items are expressed like that. Not only items seven, but item and some of tags. So it's difficult to capturing the item itself by only look, finding the location of item. Because yeah, the words are split between <laughs> the, the tag in the middle of the word. Yeah, yeah. very strange. That's true. So I removing those things first. Is style. I removing style tags by using finding the location of. P is type and also the phone text like this one and also name text like this one and and the 10k itself has using most of the cases using the HTML text so after extracting HTML information we need to convert the plane text and there are many ways so one way is to using beautiful scoop by using get text but I think it didn't di distinguish the change of line so I use the, the method of strings which keep containing or maintaining the change of the line so we can see we can maintain the title or the change of paragraph and things like that. Yes, and so yeah, this is the main part. So I use same logic like Professor Kevin used. So I identify the item six and item seven and item seven A so the MDNA section is mainly between the item 7 and item 7A. So finding the location of those things. Some of the files I had, it was item 2, and some of them they are item 1. Sorry, so, item 2? Yeah, it's not always item 7. It happens to be like my uh, oh, yeah. 10Ks where it's item 1 or 2. Item 1 or 2 is the MDNA? Yeah. Like are those... Two, uh, Small businesses or? Yes, 10K slash A or things like that have done have item seven. So if there is a I, no item seven, yeah, just keep recording that. Yeah, there is no MDNA and, 
and after uh, looking at yeah, this file, we can see which one is really don't have item seven or not. So he just ignored the problem. Right? <laughs> <laughs> And some companies don't have item 7As, and some com most of the companies have item 7A, but some companies don't have item 7A, so it's better to keep recording item 8. So, and this kind of some if, if then else project. I have some components which is really impossible to use. How many lines of code do you have? <laughs> so this is the just brief the result. So in the this filing there are two item six. One is located at almost four thousand and also two hundred thousand location and. So we can guess these are the locating of the tail of the content because it is located nearly and this is a little far from. So mainly using those yeah, so two you locations. So you would take uh, 207, 520? Yes, this one and this. And then, uh, okay, that one, Thanks. Yes, so this one is both. Yes, yeah, so minus one. Some companies don't have MDNA like it said. So what was your success rate? Or you did 100 documents? Or how many? 100, 113. 113 yeah, so documents. So how yeah. many of them, out of how many were you able to extract the MDNA? 100 on tape, yeah. 100? So, yeah. Oh, you did 100, not 100. And how many were because there was no idea? Uh, actually, I haven't seen those 13 documents. I need to look at those 13 lists. Okay. Yeah, but a few of the first one don't have yeah, the MDNA. And this is the one of the central of the MDNA. So why does that include item one? Is that just part of the I I can set. I know, but uh, in the middle. Item one misses. So it's part of one. I think it's I need to see. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> Come back to the 10K and look. That's my old power company. Okay, is that it? Yeah. Very good, thank you. Oh, he's 
study the text, right? When you study ah, the text. I the HTML, but I'm removing some kind of tag, text. So, kind of between things. When you started with HTML? Yeah, yeah. You started with HTML, but don't be the text. And then he tried to find out in the NDA section. So oh, after you convert to text. Right. Yeah. So, so the, what do you think about that, Shaq? What we usually do is, what I usually do is study you do HTML and find out the sections and then convert it to text. Professor, but in that case, we can confront all those difficulty problems. That like what? Item is divided by the text, like this. <laughs> <laughs> you have to search for Where is it? <laughs> try again, try again, try again. What I use is search for the old text, HTML text, you start with the item. Yeah, but in that case, you know, you can you can write you know the general expressions, item and seven. You know, some some company just you know explain this item seven, and some company could. There's some weird HTML codes in there, so you can use it. You know, general expression. You can find out that regular expression. A regular expression, not a general expression. It's a regular expression. You can find the portion and then convert to the HTML. It's, it's totally up to you. It's totally up to you, but that's what I use. Yeah. Actually, we did it, but however, um, but we Download them all. It's uh, almost two gigabytes compressed for each is year. Is it just the 10k or 10k, 10q? It's they call it 10x. Do they also take, they take the MDNA too? Ah, uh, I'm not sure. Oh. But Sometimes people just want to look at it. Okay. All the years. So every year, right? Yeah, every year, every starting year. from 2004. Let me. Yeah, check. when Edgar went online. What's the 19? Check it out, Max. 1996. Anyway, so maybe we don't have to do this exercise, but it's nice to understand what goes into it, and we may find other situations. Scoring method. Did you use a scoring method? It's actually from 1994 to 2016. Um, next, so... Oh, it's going to be... Oh, actually, what are you talking about? It's all the... Okay. Basic. They call so, uh, this first... Uh, today we're going to talk about... Okay, so uh, we're just actually doing all the tricks. I really think okay. this is fun okay. time. Okay. This one? So, we all know what parts of speech are. Yes. Uh, yeah. They did. Yeah. They did. 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 You know, so uh, why would you want to, why do we care what part of speech text is? Well, you get a lot of information from that. For example, apparently someone was telling you today that the number of verbs in a sentence is a good measure of sentence complexity. How do you know the number of verbs? Well, you have to tag each word by its yes. part of speech. So parts of speech taggers are based on manually tagged. Now, there's a new version by Google, which Ian was also telling me about. We're not talking about this. What's it called? Google what? SyntaxNet. Google SyntaxNet? Yes. Okay, you can try that out. I don't know anything about it. But, they but when I do part of speech tagging, or what I have done in the past, they just, they just expert, so part of speech tagging is based on manually tagged corpuses. Okay. 
Okay? So like uh, newspaper articles, phone calls, books, all these different corpuses of text. People went through, linguists went through and manually coded the, these texts as, you know, noun, verb, and so on. And they put them in these electronic files, you know, so that they could be stored on your computer. And then we could use those files to create part of speech patterns. So the best part of speech tagger that we have, maybe Google's the best one, what I've used in the past, is this one based on the Wall Street Journal, because it has texts most similar to the type of text we're going to look at. And uh, it's called the, the, the documents that were manually tagged are called the Penn Tree Bank. Penn for the University of Pennsylvania, Tree Bank. And basically, if we look up Penn Tree Bank, Very uh, good part of speech. And let's go to I don't know. Right? This, here we go. So we get a list of all the different parts of speech. This one I don't like as much. Let's find one with some examples. see the different parts of speech. They're like 50 or so. So you, you, what you can do is you can take a sentence and uh, run it through a part of speech tag and I'll show you. And you'll get for each word a tag associated with it. Right? So uh, let's go through some code. So NLTK have installed and working on here. Yeah, it has these part speech tagger engines built into it. Usually when I tag a word, it just has one part speech. But it may not be the right part speech, right? We're not sure the sense of the word. Right? We're, not, we're getting our best guess. So the way part of speech tags work is they can work by looking at words one one word at a time. And if you're using the pantry bank, based on the Wall Street Journal corpus, they'll say, oh, the most common part of speech for this word is noun or verb. So we're going to call it verb. That's how it works. Now, what you can do is you can look at two words together. So then it will say, oh, OK, the most common part of speech tag for this word when it's preceded by this other word or followed by this other word is this. So now we get that part of speech. So we have a little bit more information. So what I do here, and you guys can, if the code works, just keep typing it in. What I do here is I say I have a default tagger. If you can't find the word, it's just going to say it's a noun. Okay. The unigram tagger, if it just looks at one word by itself, then that's the unigram tagger. Um, if you can't find that word in my unigram tagger, like it'll back off to the default tagger. So just call it a noun. Okay. I have my bigram tagger, which looks at two words together. Uh, I can't say for sure if it looks at the word before or the word after or both. But if you can't, if you if it finds two words in your text, and so it's going to look for those two words in the Wall Street Journal corpus. If it can't find those two words together, then it's going to back off to the unigram tagger. Make sense? And just it's tagging one word. So, but it's going to look for two words to get a better sense of what part of speech that one word is. Well, I'll, you'll see how it works when we do an example. And then I do a trigram tagger, which we'll look at three words. So you're tagging one word, but you're looking at it in the context of three words instead of just one word. So you have these three words. The tagger will look for it in the wall, look for all three words, 
uh, including the word that you're looking at, trying to tag. It'll look for those three words in the Wall Street Journal corpus. If you can't find them, it'll use the binder tagger. And let's go through an example. I feel like I'm not able to concisely describe how this works. But it takes a few minutes to load up the taggers. Are you guys doing that right now? That's why I have these print statements, because it takes a few minutes. Did it work for you, Maurice? I didn't try. Oh, you didn't try? Okay. Did anyone else try? Okay. Okay. You don't have to. Just watch. Just watch. Okay. Did you try? Did it work? Or is it still running? Oh, it did work. Okay, my computer's slow. Yours is fast. What about your Windows Microsoft Surface? Oh, you haven't put it in NFK yet. Oh, okay. Okay, so let me remind myself uh, how this code works. So we have these three taggers now called TT, PT, UT, and DT, right? So I know that uh, to, to uh, use a tagger, you have to uh, convert a sentence. Say you want to tag a whole sentence. First, you have to convert the sentence to a list of words, okay? So I can say words equals list, and then our sentence. What should we? What should the sentence be? Uh, any sentence? Any sentence? <laughs> yeah, any sentence. Okay. Like, related to business. Oh, we like this. We fashion. like take uh, it plus take my. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't Personal pronoun. Personal pronoun. Let's see, plural pronoun. Can you edit that out? So PRP okay. means personal pronoun. You got that? When I was wrong. VBP. So that's some sort of verb. Single person. Single, single present. Single what? Present tense verb?
This is a determiner. All right. I think other determiners are like A, the, and, and clash. So now, this, this worked great. Nice. Should we try a different sentence? Let's try to trick it. Okay? Yeah. How risky can we go with the default factor now? Okay. That's an interesting sentence. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> now, whatever. Let's do it. Okay. I know you were asking me a question. Yeah. But you know what? This is good. How is WRB? What does that mean? Let's add the verb where. Risky, I know that one's adjective. Can, and be, is that modal? Uh, another perp, we, personal pronoun. Go, some sort of verb. With, so in is preposition, I know that one. Determiner, uh, noun, so with the default tagger. See, this should be an adjective, or, or default tagger is a noun together. Default tag. It's it's so it's saying this is a noun and this is a noun. But, uh, oh, and now what is RB? Adverb. RB is an adverb. Okay. I guess it's Great. So we know how to use the part of speech. We know how to get the parts of speech out of parents. And this is based on the pantry Now. Last I checked, the NLTK only comes with 10% of the pen treatment, probably because it's proprietary and it fired the whole thing. But luckily, since we're all academics, we have Rutgers resources, we can download the whole pen treatment free and then point NLTK to our whole treatment that's been downloaded. Uh, you don't have to do that, okay? I have the pen tree bank on my computer. If you want to get a copy, just see if you can find it on Rutgers first. And see if you can figure out how to point the tag, the tagger to your new files instead of the old pen tree bank files. So just so you're aware, there's only, last I checked, only 10% of the pen tree bank is being used right now. So it'll work better if you have more data, right? Okay. All right. So yeah, so we know how to do part of speech. So how do you, uh, how would you get the part of speech out of this? You know, this is a, looks like it's a list of tuples, right? Mm -hmm. So you just have to do the bracket zero. So this is uh, zero, zero. This is zero, one, you understand? One zero one one two zero two one. Oh. Abby, you got it. Abby, this is a list of tuples. It's a list of tuples. Tuples? Yes. Tuples in parentheses. Lists in square brackets. Oh. tag words zero, if I print this, what's it going to print? Oh. What? Oh. It'll pr print the first tuple, because this is item zero in the list. This is item one. Okay. This is item two. Okay. This is item three. You said keep going. This is item four. <laughs> <laughs> this is item five, six. 
Now, each, is that it for you? All right. Now, in item, so let's, let's prove you right. Since you said, yeah, you're right, it's the first time. So now, if you want to get how out of there, what do I, what do I, how do I change it? What's that? Maybe type of words, uh, zero. Like that? So now we're getting the first item in the first tuple. So if we print that out, okay. this is just stuff you get used to. Very useful. You need to go. You can do this right there. Okay. So now uh, we can access each word in its part of speech, right? We can go through and do whatever we want. Okay. So what do we want to do with it? Any ideas? Count the tagged words? Well, they're all tagged. <laughs> we can tag them all. So 100% of words are tagged. What does that mean about company performance? Related to the, uh, the bin, uh, bin three book tags. The what? Related you know, uh, to the, the three, three bank. The three bank tags? Yeah. What about it? Do you count what? Uh, so I just didn't hear what you said before, that someone said you can measure complexity by counting the verbs, and can you count the tags for the verbs? You could count the verbs, right? That's easy. All you go to is you go to your list uh, on that web page. It's not up right now. <coughs> it's on. Uh, so you go here, and you go and you find all the verb tags. See it? There's like a bunch of them. And, and you just count how many tags are verbs. And then you can have the total number of verbs in your document, or you can divide it by the total number of words. So the rate of uh, verbs per document. You know? Or you want to go sentence by sentence, you can say average number of verbs per sentence. That was, that's a super easy one, right? So let's try something else. I needed creative minds here. I know it's hard on the spot. So, yeah. So now, you know, the personality of the speaker, so how would you measure that? Um, for example, uh, in the research of Seagull personality, narcissistic Seagull, then you can use more words, I, then we. Okay, right. So you're saying you can, you, you can look for these uh, personal pronouns, right? Yeah. The thing about personal pronouns, there's so few of them. Just count how many times I we there aren't very many there are very many, very many pronouns right in the dictionary so they're easy to list but what are the pronouns uh, so we have PR personal pronoun PRP oh PP personal pronouns this list may not match up exactly. I don't see PRP in this list here. <coughs> so this may not be the definitive pen tree bank as used by uh, NLTK. So, right. so I mean, our first clue is it's PEN tree bank. So maybe it's the wrong one. PEN. Yeah. Can you be a better list to use. Okay. What else can we look for? We can look for the who, what, where, where, why, how. You can search for any individual part of speech. But how would we use them together? Constructs 
uses a uh, part of speech tags, at least one. I must say, I don't get enough credit for having designed that and implemented it. Don't you agree? Uh, so it was the uh, passive voice. Remember passive voice? I use part of speech tags to identify a passive voice. So how did I do that? Does it say in the article? It doesn't say. It doesn't say exactly. Oh, you're right. 
But if you had past participle, that's UDN. Yeah. <laughs> then consumed was also a UDN. Has been consumed. Well, you can, there's a, I mean, you can say it was consumed. It's the same thing. But if you have a third person verb, you're just moving the option of any one of the application. On all of these, you can say by me. I mean, you can always tack on the end by me. It was pursued by me. That's because you have the third person verb. Yeah. You can have a whole sentence here. I 
<laughs> I just had to add a passive voice, you know, to test it out. Uh, here we go. This this looks a little better. I should run this. Looking in this window of words again. Yeah, I'm looking at this window of words. And if the first word is VBN, I don't think actually this one will work. It's just not. I'll send you my code and you can play with it. So if the Nouns. 
So it's how descriptive is the text? Because you're looking at the ratio of modifiers to the verbs and nouns, the things being modified. So how descriptive is it, right? So that's all. It's just for practice doing parts of speech tagging. Um, again, right. So I'll send you this little snippet of code. If you can get it working, great. It works. It's great code. I want you to tell me how, I want you to test it out for me and see if you can, see if it doesn't work in some instances so I can improve it. It's, it's not back to price. Any questions? Was it class fun today? I like part oh. of speech. Um, yeah. Can we type the uh, milkshake is consume? Uh, the tag for the consume is noun for all of you. Oh, it's a noun for all of you? Okay, maybe because I have the full pantry name. So another thing you might want to try is to download the full pantry name. <laughs> this is optional. But it'll improve your tag. Now I checked. You can use the pantry name commercially for only like $10,000. Let me do it. Alright, thanks.